Reading from the book of the prophet Zechariah. Sing and rejoice, O daughter Zion. See, I am coming to dwell among you, says the Lord. Many nations shall join themselves to the Lord on that day, and they shall be his people, and he will dwell among you. And you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. The Lord will possess Judah as his portion in the Holy Land, and he will again choose Jerusalem. Silence all mankind in the presence of the Lord. He stirs forth from his holy dwelling. Verbum Domini. The Almighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked upon his lowly servant. From this day all generations will call me blessed. The Almighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. He has mercy on those who fear him in every generation. He has shown the strength of his arm. He has scattered the proud in their conceit. He has cast down the mighty from their thrones and has lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has come to the help of his servant Israel, for he has remembered his promise of mercy, the promise he made to our fathers, to Abraham and his children forever. Lexia Sancti Evangelii Secundum Matteum. While Jesus was speaking to the crowds, and his mother and his brothers appeared outside wishing to speak with him, Someone told him, your mother and your brothers are standing outside asking to speak with you. And he said in reply to the one who told him, who is my mother, who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of my heavenly father is my brother and sister and mother. Verbum Domini. Today 
Today we have the memorial of the presentation of Our Lady. Her presentation in the temple, her dedication, uh, that she was dedicated to God, be brought to the temple. And this is part of the tradition of the church. It's not explicitly in scripture, <clears throat> but uh, it has been believed since you know, the days of the early church that she was dedicated to the Lord from her, from her earliest childhood. Today, the reading for this particular memorial is from Matthew's Gospel, and it highlights this new family of God that Jesus wishes to create. And he says the criteria is that whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Brother and sister here are general terms that could be used for cousin or you know some other relative, not um, not always literally brother or sister. Jesus, you know, Mary had no other children but Jesus. <clears throat> and it highlights also her virtue. It's not a disrespect to Mary to say that, oh, she's not uh, doing the will of, so she stays outside. But it actually speaks to her, her, her greatest virtue, that she is the one without sin, completely dedicated to God, given over to the Lord. She's immaculately conceived. She's born without original sin by a prevenient grace from the Lord. And she consequently never committed a sin her whole life. Uh, she was completely pure. She is the promised woman of Genesis 3.15 when God says to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. She is that promised woman that's a complete enmity, is enemies with sin and evil. It, that evil sin has nothing to do with her. She's at complete odds with them. So she consequently perfectly does God's will, fulfills God's will in her life. Remember her response to the angel, Archangel Gabriel, at the Annunciation. Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. Let it be done to me according to your word. That she completely gives herself over to the plan of God for her and her life. And in the Greek, it denotes more than mere passive acceptance. There's a energetic desire or wish on her part, by the part of speech that's used, uh, to do God's will in her life, not just passively disengaged, but that she seeks to fulfill God's will. And we can appreciate that as fallen creatures, the difficulty of that, you know, to have that desire, that energy, you know, to do God's will, do it best we can. Martha Robam, uh, the mystic and victim soul, was once asked, you know, what do you do if you're unable to abandon yourself to God? And she responded, well, abandon yourself anyway, you know? That's the, the essence of abandonment is, no, I can't do it. I have to trust God completely. Abandon yourself anyway. Yes, I have these fears and I'm worried about the future and et cetera, et cetera, but I'll abandon myself anyway. You know, I'll, I'll trust God anyway. You know, for those of us who desire to be part of this family of God, to be part of the brothers and sisters and mother that Jesus talks about, you know, he tells us to do God's will and you know, those who do the will of God. You know, that challenge arises for us all the time. What is God's will in our life? I was recently reading a spiritual book that I took some reflections from it here that, that greatly, I thought was a great help in looking at this. So, you know, we could say, what is God's will? What is his will for us in our life? And in discerning that, you know, we use our reason that God has given us, the brains he's given us, and we use faith and inspiration. We look for maybe signs or some inspiration from the Lord. But maybe a first step that we need to do is just to deliberate, you know, not to, in a very, in an unhurried way, to look at the situation, to analyze it, its different aspects, and to consider our motivations. You know, what's our personal motivation? It might be pushing us one way or the other, 
you know, is it a motivation to act only in our personal interests, what we get out of it, you know, to try to purify that. And then also, you know, to pray for the light of the Holy Spirit and the grace to act in conformity with the will of God. That Mary was given this incredible grace to be immaculately conceived and grace not to sin that she complied with perfectly. You know, we need to ask for grace. You know, we're wicked and fallen and, you know, given over to our faults and weaknesses. We need God's help and to simply ask. Sometimes we don't do that before making a decision. You know, the Lord does not want us to be self-sufficient. And I think we constantly are tempted to get out of that that relationship of dependency on God where we have to go back and ask. We have to abandon ourselves to him. We have to beg for his direction. And something that can open us up to that fundamental attitude of dependence is to discuss it with someone else. You know, not in a gossipy way or something, but just to open ourselves up to another in humility you know, can help foster that humility, give us that disposition of humility to depend on God ultimately, to receive, you know, to be in that attitude to receive grace and light. It helps us on a practical level to get advice from one another, uh, from someone else to, to get another set of eyeballs on it, so to speak. But also I think it helps that surrender to God ultimately, that I'm willing to to take advice, to open myself to another. Hopefully we can have a, it doesn't have to be a priest, it can just be a good friend that we can talk to. And if we don't have absolute clarity of what to do, you know, as long as it's not, you know, immoral or wrong in some way, serious way, you know, I can act and make that decision to, you know, what I think God's will is here um, as long as my intention is good, that I'm trying to seek God's will to do the right thing. And sometimes we want a certitude that's just not there. There might be a choice between two good things, and we just have to trust God. You know, and if our intention's right, that we're trying to please Him, trying to do the right thing, our decision won't be far off. I remember I asked that of a, a wise elderly nun one time about some of the decisions we have to make in religious life, community life. And she told me that exact same thing. She said, you know, if your intention's good, her experience was, it's not gonna be far off, you know, what choice you make. And then if it is a little bit off, you can correct it. You know, sometimes our pride and fear of being judged by others can paralyze us. We're afraid to make a mistake, you know, what, would it look like if we made a mistake? But in humility, we know that we can be wrong from time to time. But our love for God urges us to act, to do something for the Lord, to make this decision. And we have shortcomings and limitations in our judgment, and all our decisions will not be perfect. You know, but still we're trying to to do God's will, so we have to make that decision. And we abandon ourselves to God with a, a disinterested, um, you know, a certain disinterestedness in ourselves and our own, what we get out of it, so to speak. You know, have this disinterested love of God that's not always looking at it through the love of, through, you know, this lens of what we get out of it. So, you know, the consequences of our decisions, you know, we, we give that over to the Lord. Perfectionism, when I was reading, wonderfully summed up this little book, was that perfectionism doesn't have much to do with sanctity. Sometimes we can just reduce it to this outward appearance or veneer, and we desire this self-sufficiency versus a, a dependence on God. Remember that blessed are the poor in spirit for the kingdom of God is theirs. That we have this inherent poverty that we're dependent on God, we're contingent, we're his creatures. And this idea of perfectionism focuses us on ourselves. And it could be a, a prideful pursuit of self here, that 
I'm not looking at the Lord. I'm not seeking his will, really. I'm trying to look good. And it might be dressed up in holiness. But we reduce this be perfect, as we hear in the Sermon on the Mount, it's a be perfect in the order of charity. You know, be, have the perfection of charity, of love of God. That's what holiness is, not this veneer of perfectionism. Sometimes we might have the temptation to be scrupulous and doubt ourselves. Or sometimes we might have a temptation to just per, to pursue a good that's beyond our strength. You know, humility is there to, to limit the will in that sense, not to go after something that God's not really calling us to or that he's not given us the strength to achieve. We might have a temptation that we're not doing enough all the time. And you know, we have the duties of our state in life, but certainly in our culture in America, it's very driven and achievement-oriented. You always have to be doing more. Well, maybe God's not asking us to do more sometimes. He's just asking us to do what he's putting in front of us according to our state in life and things that he makes clear to us. Or maybe we're tempted uh, that we're not really doing it for love of God, always second-guessing our motivations, not in a healthy sense, but kind of a repetitive, neurotic way or something. Or that maybe we have a sense that God's just always displeased with us. You know, all these things take us off. You know, it's a perfectionism that takes our focus off the Lord and pursuing him. So we're called, in a certain sense, to be at peace with our nothingness, our limitations, our poverties, and even our falls. You know, in our struggles against sin, we're going to fall. And we have to ask God, you know, for forgiveness and to keep on pursuing that holiness, to keep up our, our prayer life, to keep maintain our peace, that yes, I fall and I repent of that. But sometimes, you know, we can lose our peace and we can be so disturbed because you know, our pride is wounded. The image that we have of ourselves is completely destroyed, the fact that we've sinned. And we can lose hope because, you know, our trust has been placed in ourselves and not in God. But we shouldn't be surprised or shocked at our falls. You know, we just have to admit we're sinners, just like everybody else. You know, take a middle seat on the bus. You know, we're not the front of the bus, the best or the worst at the end of the bus. Just take a middle seat. We're sinners. We repent, we get up and begin again. And the good news for us in this loving providential God is that he's able to draw good from all things. St. John of the Cross said that love is able to profit from everything, the good as well as the bad, that it finds in me, and to transform it into itself. Meaning that you could take a, a fruit from all our struggle and difficulties and repentance from sin to increase our love of God, refocus us on God, seek to do his will. You know, St. Augustine, Augustine, he would say that, you know, that scripture verse that, you know, all things that God can draw good from all things or can serve, serve him in some way, that he says, even for our sins, even for our sins that we turn back from, turn back to the Lord, that we can profit, that God can use that in some way. This is not to, to accept lukewarmness or uh, contentment with mediocrity. No, we have to struggle, we have to repent, we have to do an examination of ourselves, correct ourselves. But in our faults, weaknesses, and sins, we have to get up again. We have to arise. There's that wonderful scene on you know, the parable of the prodigal son where he's in the distant land feeding the pigs, you know, working as, a, uh, as an indentured servant there, where he comes to his senses and arising, he comes back to his father's house. It's a wonderful image. That, that, that word for arise is the same word to describe Jesus' resurrection. That through the power of that resurrection, it gives us life that draws us to God himself, working in us, that paschal mystery that we have to arise again. 
and not to quit praying, not to you know, despair of grace, that God might not give me the grace or something, but to continue praying, asking for that strength to avoid sin. And another fruit he might draw from our struggles and faults is that it gives us humility, gives, gives us a certain tenderness and mercy towards others, and you know, that we realize our own weakness and our own sinfulness, that I won't be as judgmental of, of others. God can draw beautiful fruits from this struggle. But it begins with seeking his will, like Mary did, you know, to be totally dedicated to him, to abandon ourselves to him, to repent of our sins, to begin again and be converted every day to his will.